we're going to finish off one John today. We didn't have very much left last week, and so we'll just polish off um, what we have left of that, and then we'll move on to another topic. So um, the, the section that we skipped from the study uh, was the section on love, and John spends uh, a bit of time talking about that, and I wanted to also spend a bit of time talking about that. And uh, that comes, uh, the first place that we'll see anyway, uh, is First John 4, 7 through 8. And he says, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, because God is love. And everyone who does not love does not know God. And that's very classically about how John writes. Uh, he always writes, um, if this is true, then this, and if otherwise, then this is true. And then we see that um, being described here. Uh, it says, because God is love, and everyone who does not love does not know God. And so um, he makes a, a point here that we've said many times um, that God is love. And, and that is God, God is the definition of love. He is the source of love. He is um, everything that is love and he defines love. Um, but it is God who defines what love is, not the world. The world has its own definition of what love is. And it calls many things love, which the Bible says are not love, which uh, God hates and, and uh, so we need to be careful about whose definition of love that we're using here. And he says, love is from God and God is love. And therefore he is the one who defines what true love is, not what the world says. And he also says, whoever loves in the way that God loves, he means, he doesn't say that in words, but he, that's what his meaning is, is born of God and knows him because of that love. And so we know God through that love because he is love. <clears throat> having worked with ministers for many years now, not all ministers do that a lot. You know, I hate to say that, and I'm not trying to be critical, mm -hmm. but they're always wondering how much money they can get, and how, what are other ways that they can get more income. It's really about the money. Mm -hmm. It's really about, and <clears throat> some other because pride, you know? Ego, yeah. Ego, they, they attracted to them, they, they need to stroke their ego, yeah. and all those things, and, it, and it's sad, you know, but uh, I, in, I had a, some, some, uh, a length of time where I was actually mentoring a new pastor, a young pastor, and I was warned, warned them, if you don't do this out of love, you, you may as well stop right now, mm -hmm. because it's a waste of your time. <clears throat> you will never succeed, uh, because if it is not driven by love in any ministry that you do, it will fail and, it will, and God will not honor it. Yeah. And it'll um, rot away, I think. Um, you're, the, that kind of love doesn't last. It, it's kind of a self-love rather than a love yeah. of others. And, and you'll get tired of it and wander away. <clears throat> That's true of us as Christians generally, I think. Um, those people who don't really have God's love in them wander off. And, and because that, that love that they do have is something coming from themselves and, and not from God. And it dies away as their interest dies away. Okay, next we're going to look at um, uh, uh, 1 John 4, 9 through 11. And in these verses... What he's doing is he's taking John 3.16 and restating it in a little different way. And he's doing that to make a point that he wants to make. And, and so he says, in this, the love of God is known to us. For God sent his only son to the world so that it shall live by him, so that the world shall live by him. In this is love. It was not that we loved God, but he has loved us. And he sent us his son, the atonement for the sake of our sins. Beloved, if God loves us in this way, we are indebted also to love one another. So if that sounds like John 3.16, it really is uh, the same author and, and many of the same words are there. And so he talks about this same idea that God sent his only son. Remember, John 3.16 says that, those same words. Um, and so that the world could live by that son that God was sending. And, and so he says, in this love, it, it was not that we love God but he has loved us. And, and so we, he, he's saying, uh, much like John 3.16 says, is um, he sent um, his son into the world, not because the world loved him, but because he loved the world so much. And, and so he sent his son to be the atonement for the sake of our sins. 
And so um, through this, God shows us true love. And, and this is the kind of sacrificial love that we should have ourselves for others, is uh, we should love those people um, who did not love him. And, and he, uh, just as he did the same thing. So he showed true love by, uh, by giving his son to people who didn't love him first. And, and so he made that sacrifice first. And, and then people, some of the people, uh, grew to love his son as well. And so that, that should be a characteristic of us as well. We should be prepared to sacrifice um, the things that are dear to us and, and, uh, and not be tied to those and willing to make those kind of sacrifices for others, even if those other people haven't, um, aren't good to us or aren't friends to us, aren't, aren't our family and, and whatever, we, we do it to help other people. And so, um, so God sent his only son, uh, again, only just like we saw in 316, uh, to mm -hmm. give life to those who believe. And so he's using this kind of restatement of John 316 to make a point. And the point is this, that we are in debt to love one another because um, Jesus was given to us without us loving uh, uh, any God or anything else like that. Um, we are in, in debt because of the, what was given to us. Um, we are in debt to pay that back by loving one another. Does that make sense that way? Uh, nothing can uh, compare to to the uh, the little Christ. Uh, one person popped into my head that I don't remember where it is. It's a bird, but uh, the Schindler guy he did a lot for a case. I don't know, hundreds of thousands of. Okay. The who? Schindler. Oh, okay. Schindler. Yeah, of Schindler's list. Yeah. Yeah. Showing that kind of love. Yeah, yeah, he did, and and he uh, he saved a lot of people through that and kept them from harm. Yeah, I remember that movie. That was a good movie, and and there are people like that, and he risked himself uh, in that process. Um, he he that did. Was the name of the movie? Schindler's that, List. That was the name. Yeah, yeah, and and he was there a real person. That wasn't just a movie. Uh, but there have been other people from World War II. Uh, some of them who stood up to Hitler and and were saying preaching against him. And they didn't make it through the, the war. They were killed for what they were saying. And so sometimes that sacrificial love may endanger our lives. Um, but, and, but this is the same kind of sacrifice that God made for us. Okay, now John says, uh, he talks about dwelling in love um, because we dwell in God. If we dwell in God, we dwell in love, he's going to say. And so every, and everyone who confesses Yeshua that he is the son of God God dwells in him and he dwells in God and we believe and we know the love that God has for us for God is love. We saw that earlier and everyone who dwells in love dwells in God. By this love is fulfilled with us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so also are we in this world. Someone has their mic open. Okay so um, he, he's talking about dwelling in God, and, and he says, if you dwell in love, true love, godly love, then you also dwell in God. There's no separation there because God is love. And, and so you, you can't uh, love, you can't dwell in God without also dwelling in love, is the point that he's making there. And notice again, as we saw before, he throws in another end times reference. He talks here about the day of judgment. And, and he says that, that if we have this love in us, that we are bold, we can be bold in the day of judgment when Jesus comes back. And, and so we won't be uh, uh, the enemies of God. Let me just see if I can do something here. No, that didn't work. You said somebody has a microphone on? Yeah, someone does. I can say yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I thought I heard something when I was up there praying, and I said, how did I turn this off? And I realized it wasn't my phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll turn it again. Yeah, you can hear it. What did you just say? <laughs> mm -hmm. They can probably hear me. I already told <clears throat> Well, actually, you said you turned off, you? Well, I was trying to, but I, I wasn't able to get to that because I've got the PowerPoint stuff going, oh, and it was stopping me. 
Okay, anyway, moving on. Yeah, she might be away from her phone right now and couldn't hear. Okay, so there, there are two things that we see there. Uh, we see that idea is that uh, God is love. Is, it means that God is inseparable from love. And that love is, um, is the love that we should have in us. And so if we dwell in that kind of love, we also dwell in God. There's no separation. You can't dwell in one and not the other. It, and, and so that's kind of a point that John has made in the past, too, is some of these things are inseparable. Love and God are inseparable. So if you really have God's love, then you have God. Or if you really have God, then you also have his love. And so if you say that you love God, but you don't show that love, then you are, you're not telling the truth. Okay, now he also talks about fear in relation to, to love. And, and um, this is another one of those uh, uh, often quoted verses. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear is by suspicion, but he who fears is not grown up in love. So in that one uh, short verse, um, he makes a, a, a number of points which are, are really good to bring up here. <laughs> and, and so the first thing he does is he contracts, he contrasts this idea of perfect love versus not grown up in love. And so he, he's saying that that if a, a Christian has that perfect love, which means he, he's fully grown up in love, um, then um, it will cast out all fear and there won't be any fear in him. But he's saying also that there are going to be others who are not grown up in love and, and are not fully loving and they have some fear in them. And, and so for, for each of us, uh, we are all maturing as Christians and, and growing towards that perfect love. And, the, and so the point is that the closer we are to having that perfect love of God in us, completely in us, then um, the less fear we will have about the future or what, what's happening in our lives, those kind of fears will go away because love drives out or casts out fear. My version says, because fear involves torment. Oh, okay. That's a little different translation. Yeah. You know, King James, it says, and I knew King John. Yeah, some words get translated in different ways in, in different translations. But I think the idea is still still there. Um, so the torment seems a little odd, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, because like, if, if you have fear, your, your soul isn't at peace. Yeah, you're, you're, you're tormented. Yeah, you're tormented. Yeah, yeah. But the way it's rendered in this translation here, it says that fear comes by suspicion. And, and and so um, that's a different idea, really. Yeah, I, uh, again, I'm putting the sermon together. I noticed that I have in, in mind the, the, the verse that I'm looking for, and, and I plug in the, 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 uh, the, search, <clears throat> the search engine, and it comes out saying something different. <laughs> in a for example, uh, if you can ask, it says, if you ask God according to his will, he will give it to you. It says, okay, I looked that one up. And it gets, and then, and then every, a lot of versions said, if you ask God according to his gifts, I said, what? <laughs> That's, That's different. <laughs> according to his gifts, yeah. it's not, not, it sounds like it's according to his capability to give it to you as opposed to whether he thinks it's right or wrong. And those are two very different things. Yeah. So it's just like the same as I and you shall receive. Mm -hmm. and, and then in that other verse, it says, uh, um, according to his will. And I can stand for, you know, or be trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's not, it, he doesn't want to do it. And it's, you know. Yeah. I, I've said it many times before, but I'll say it one more time. Um, I always encourage people to have more than one Bible translation that they look at for exactly those kind of reasons. And, and I myself do that. Um, uh, there's a kind of a favorite translation that I use most of the time, but many, many times I'll go and look at other translations. And you can do that on the web. There's a site called BibleHub.com. I use that one. And, and you can go there and you can see something like 23 different English translations. And if you want Spanish translations, it'll give you a pile of those to look at. And that gives you a, an opportunity to see how different translators are translating it. And sometimes you'll be surprised at, at what translators are doing, adding words that just aren't there. 
And sometimes I'll go to the original Greek or the original Hebrew even to see if it's in the original. And it has a lot of versions of it. Yeah. And I would compare them because it's an important verse like that. Yeah, definitely. We have to be careful with them. Okay, uh, so uh, his, his point here is that a, a Christian who has fear is an immature Christian and, and not fully grown up in love. And, and so he's not saying that every Christian has no fear. He's saying that um, the, the closer you are to God, the, the, the more you have his love in you, um, the, the less you will have fear in your life. And, and so he, he says there the love of God drives out fear. And, and so the idea there is that if you perfectly love God, you fully trust in him and you have no fear. So if, if you trust God in everything, then you aren't concerned about what will happen in the future because you know that God is there and he is in control of everything. And so there's no reason to fear. Now, that doesn't mean that you aren't going to have an accident and die or something uh, like that. It, it, it doesn't mean that all, all good things are going to come to you. It, it just means... <laughs> It, it, it uh, now we're getting an echo from your phone, Pastor. <laughs> I, I, I was going in there trying to to mute. Okay. Did you get it, or he gave up? Um, okay, so. Um, so why is John mentioning fear in this section that he's talking about love? And, and I think the answer is actually pretty clear when you look at what First John is really about. Remember that there were Gnostics coming into the church, and, and they shook the church when they left. A lot of the church people weren't sure if they were on the right path, path and the Gnostics were the ones who were on the right path. And so this whole uh, epistle has been written to the church to, to strengthen them and say, you are the ones who are on the right path, and it's the Gnostics who are on the wrong path. And, and so he says you shouldn't have fears like that if you're fully grown up in love. Um, you should be trusting in God and knowing that he's going to take you where he wants to take you. Well, personally, I don't know how, how that feels about the Gnostic level when people get because it has happened to us in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, false teachers, yeah. And then... Um, the, the people, other people who are left in NHU when we left probably had that same kind of question. Um, and, and are who's right here? Are, are we on the right track or are they on the right track? I, I say that, but we've decided that I'll come in and just go back and that other person left. And I go, well, his best friends took over and they're pretty much the same. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And they say, oh, no, well, you don't know. That's what you said the first time. So I'm telling you again, it's still the same thing. Yes. They would never learn. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. They, don't, they don't learn. Yeah, and you did that study some time ago, the seven different levels of Christians. And then Christians do grow up, or they should grow up over time. And, and some of them are still down at lower levels and working their way up. And most of the babies are the ones that are the lower levels are immature Christians. And they criticize people, they get cause conflict and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so continuing on with fear here. So, so John has been talking about fear and that fear and love aren't together. If you have the perfect love of God within you, you won't have any fear. And, and as I said before, but I'll say it one more time here. Uh, John isn't saying that bad things will not happen to you as a Christian. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean your life is, is going to be perfect. Uh, and we know that because uh, we know the early Christians, uh, they were uh, tortured and persecuted in all sorts of ways and killed. And, and so we, we know that um, good Christians uh, can have bad things happen to them. But he, what he is saying is that we will live without fear of what might happen to us. Even though it might be God's will that we will uh, come to the end of our lives shorter than we might have, have hoped for, um, that is his will, and we're happy with that. And we don't fear about what is coming in the future. We, we live happy and content in, and loving in, in the love that God has for us. And many verses say that same idea, um, that the worst the world can do to us is kill us. It, it, it's only our bodies. Um, and... and so we have no reason we shouldn't be fearing. It's not like our lives end when our bodies die. 
uh, and because we have that hope of a, of a future, uh, we have no reason to be fearing. And Christ went through all that suffering and uh, torture. I mean, who are we to say, hey, you know, why are you doing this to me, God? Yeah, Christ yeah. Good point. On the other hand, when he was resurrected, he was showing us there is nothing to fear in death. Mm -hmm. But he says he conquered death. Yeah. And, um, and, there, and, and, and the Lord has never given us a spirit of fear, you know, but, but of victory and, and, and of courage. And, but I think when you're in your worst time, you, you forget that, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we often forget. Don't look back. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's what I do sometimes to get the Taliban, if you ask that question, he will get me. So sometimes the phone is fine, I hate to be on the phone. Oh, I think they'll come look at it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll move on and then we'll come back to that. Okay, so we're finally at the final verse of First John, uh, and that's at, uh, verse 21 of chapter 5. And, and he does something strange here. You probably aren't familiar with the word non sequitur, but it's, it's a word that, that means uh, a person has been talking along a certain path of discussion, and suddenly he says something that seems to be completely unrelated to anything that he said in the past. And that's what the last verse is here. Um, he hasn't been speaking about worshiping idols or anything at, at, throughout the whole of this five chapters. And all of a sudden he begins or he ends this whole epistle by saying, my children, keep yourselves from the worship of idols. And so he, had, he hasn't even touched on idolatry in, in any way throughout all of this the five chapters here. Now suddenly he does in this. And a lot of people wonder about this, uh, what his point is. And, and so there's two different ways to look at it. Um, if you see this as a general warning against idol worship, um, it, it appears that he's just kind of at the last minute thrown in this little disconnected thought um, and just tossed it in. But that doesn't seem like John, from everything we've seen in, in these past five chapters, you would expect him to elaborate on that and, and talk a whole lot more about idolatry rather than just throwing this one last uh, thought in at the end. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll read this also from NLT because I thought that that was worth uh, looking at a different translation here. He says it from the NLT, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. And, and I think that that's a good description of the intent that John has here. Um, he's, he's actually asking them, and, and many commentators see it this way, that, that this is a statement, again, about the Gnostics, because this whole five-chapter uh, epistle has been about Gnosticism and the Gnostics and, and what they believe. And so um, he's, the, the meaning behind this would be that uh, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. And, and so he's referring back to the Gnostics who were trying to do exactly that thing. They were trying to have other things come in place of God in, in your heart. And so he's really inferring that they were idolaters, that the Gnostics were idolaters. And that is because they were worshiping another God. Although they would have claimed that they were worshiping Jesus, they had constructed this new version of Jesus that wasn't the same thing as, as the Bible says. And, and nothing, certainly, that the, the apostles would have recognized. There's a verse that you found. It's in John 13, 14. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this one, I am 15. For I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also have washed one of his feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. He's talking about that. Yeah, but that's the only one that I can think about that she was talking about. <clears throat> okay, anyway, anyway, I will summarize First John and then we will be done with it. So the whole problem that this epistle deals with is the Gnostics. Uh, these, these group of people 
who believed in Gnosticism, and we've talked about it, what Gnosticism believes. Um, they got into this church, into a Christian church somehow, and they were beginning to teach their false teachings inside of that church. And at some point, they the church um, uh, wouldn't accept them anymore, and they left the church. We, we don't know the details of anything there. But they left behind a remnant of people, like as I was saying earlier, that they were unsure about what was right. Were they the ones who were right, or was it the Gnostics and their ideas that were right? And so the whole point behind this epistle is that John is dealing with this situation where the people in the church aren't, aren't sure of, of who's correct, and they had these bunch of people leave their church. And so he's refuting all of the Gnostic beliefs, and, and he spends a lot of time going through different parts of that. And, and um, he and they had, as if you remember right, they had different beliefs about who Jesus was and, and, and what he was, and also um, because not of Gnosticism and the way it believes, they were immoral people that didn't live a moral life. And so John spends quite a bit of time talking about those problems and what they lead to. And then he goes on to show how denying the reality of Jesus is denying many other things. So once you've denied um, the reality of Jesus, you've denied things like he's the son of God. You've denied other things that the, the Bible says clearly about what Jesus is. And, and ultimately you create a God of your own creation. It's not the same as what you see in, in Bible. And, and so um, the whole purpose of this uh, epistle has been to deal with all of those aspects of what Gnosticism was teaching and how it's wrong and how it messes up everything that Jesus did. So John states three goals in there. Uh, I didn't point these out uh, specifically when we uh, passed those verses, but he, he, his goals that he says that he has are one, that you will have communion with us, the apostles and the father and the son. And, and he wants that uh, to, to be something that they will have. And, and he says of the Gnostics that they have no communion with God because they have darkness in it. If you remember when we covered that part, he says that the, the darkness that leads them to uh, immoral lives is not uh, compatible with God. And so it's not possible for them to be in communion with God. So he, he's making that uh, distinction there. He says, you are in communion. I want you to be in communion with us, but the Gnostics are not in. And here's why, he says. And in, uh, his second stated goal is that you will not sin. He doesn't want them to spin, sin, and we, we talked about that uh, quite a bit because he spends a fair bit of time on that idea, and he talks about mortal sin. And, and so with the Gnostics, he says, they have mortal sins that are not forgiven, and because of that, they uh, are not in communion with God, and more than that, they have no hope of eternal life. And that's kind of what he comes to in, in the last few verses of this epistle, is that he says, um, I want you to know that you have eternal life, that, that you are on the right path that leads to eternal life. And the Gnostics, they have no hope for eternal life because they have that mortal sin that is unforgiven and they are not in communion with God. So uh, it might seem a, a trivial difference sometimes when you uh, picture Jesus in a little different way, but we have that in our own time. There are people who want to see Jesus in a different way. And, and so you might have thought if you were living at that time, well, these Gnostics, they just have a little different view of Jesus. That's all. It doesn't really matter much. But that's a, a lot of what G John has been talking about here. He's been saying that that little difference is not a little difference. It's a really big difference. And it changes everything about who Jesus was and his reality and what he offers and, and what the promises are, that, that his uh, life is, is an example to us because uh, he was a person, a real being, human being like we were. And, and so what might seem like a small difference isn't a small difference. And, and in the case of the Gnostics and, and other people too sometimes, that difference can be one that leads to a morality where morality doesn't matter much. You, you just live doing whatever you want to do, whatever feels good. And, and that will lead to intentional sin and that remains unforgiven. And so in our time, we have some teachings that are, are sort of like that. Um, one of them is the once saved, always saved, which goes by many other names, eternal security and lots of different things. But the, the idea there basically is that you can't lose your salvation. No matter what you do, you're, you're saved for sure. And, and, and so that's similar in a way to what the Gnostics were saying. The Gnostics were saying that salvation comes from hidden knowledge. And the people who believe in the once saved, always saved idea believe that they can't lose their salvation. So it's a little different, but it really comes down to the same thing. It gives you an opportunity to, to live an immoral life and think that you're okay. And, and so it's, 
um, I, it might be hard to say that uh, the once saved, always saved is, is a sin in and of itself, but it leads you to um, a, um, the idea that you can live a less moral life and that it is somehow acceptable. And that's where the Gnostics got to that same idea by a little different path. They believed that because salvation came from hidden knowledge, that it didn't matter how they lived, if they lived a moral life or not. I heard one, another different version of that recently. Um, you know, I got a chance to visit Eastern Hospital, and I was kind of surprised because I, I had asked some of the people there that I knew from way back in the day, that how are this other family that used to go to our church in way, you know, one of the churches that, that I pastored many years ago, and they go, oh, they're going to um, the Hedonic Church, you know, and they recently had one of those, I don't know if it's Pentecost, or is it the one where they all get stay out of their homes and they go out and um, what, what was it? Oh, you, oh, you're talking about one of the feast days. Um, yeah, one of the feast yes, days. okay, yeah, tabernacles. Yeah, and, and so they went, and so they said, they would, and, and so I said, they didn't even invite me to their, to their Messiah gathering in that, in that feast. <clears throat> and, and I thought, well, we're all going to go to the backyard and hang out or something. But it turned out they met at a hotel. <laughs> yeah, said, some people. Hotel. And so they went in there, and there was a lot of food and things. But they were all drinking a lot of liquor and beer. Hmm. <clears throat> they weren't having fun. They were, they were, not, they were not frightened by it. No, not at all. And um, and so the brother that I was talking to, I asked him, did you ask the pastor why they're doing that? Yeah, he had a bottle with him. And he said, we're like the angels. We can do whatever we want. Oh, so, really? Yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> uh, so long as we do all of our, our, our different rituals that we do. Yeah. yeah. That's. But, but, and he said, that doesn't make any sense. So, no, that's the way it is. We're like the angels. God is no longer going to judge us because we, we are his people now. And, and sometimes we make us do things that we shouldn't do, but you know, it's okay. So he goes, okay, I don't think so. And so this year he was invited again and he said, I'm going to go to that. No. <laughs> so, but, but it's shocking, you know? Yeah. That because I, I heard everyone say all the same, but these guys are saying that they're like the angels and they can do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. Well, all through history, there have been all sorts of different groups who came up with different justifications for that. <clears throat> there was one uh, group called the Ranchers. You probably never heard of them. Uh, a really small sect, but but their idea was that. Um, you had to be immoral. You had to live an immoral life to show that God could be forgiving of you. And so that you, you showed that God was forgiving by living immorally. <laughs> the Romans, the Romans said something, what shall we say that we should keep on sinning so that God's grace can be magnified? Yeah, That's similar. That's contrary to that. Yeah. <clears throat> like, people, like people in the world going to work, or because you see, you see this church is this cowboy church. Mm -hmm. And it's all kind of men. Only that not for baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <This word. laughs> yeah, who knows? They they might just wear cowboy boots and other than that they're perfectly normal Christians. But yeah. Christ is the purpose of that. Well, he did sin. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're Christ yeah. They all talk about everything else that is except sanctify themselves. And that's what that's what yes. God wants us to do. Yes. And they just go around and around and doing everything else. Yeah. But yeah, their their nature calls to them and it calls to us too, but um, they're answering that call with a yes. Um, and and so um, we, we feel those same desires within ourselves, but we say, no, we know that isn't right. And so we don't involve ourselves in those sorts of things. But there are lots of other people who want those things and they find a way to twist scripture around some way to make it perfectly acceptable for them to do that. Well, the verse that I was looking for is in Romans chapter six and verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin 
that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? And says, do you not know that many of us were baptized unto, into G Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism in that death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall now walk in the newness of life. Yeah. So, I don't know, people don't read about their Bible. <laughs> they can read the whether they want. Well, just like Peter said, there are people who twist Paul's words because they're complicated ideas and make them into other things. What Rick was talking about is, uh, is Romans 7, 5. Can you read that? Um, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. <laughs> 7, 5. 7, 5. That when they used to read, and it's kind of says when they used to read um, flesh, mm -hmm. they were flesh. But if you live in the spirit, you shouldn't be doing the things of the flesh. When you live in the spirit, you shouldn't be doing what the flesh wants no. you to do. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, and I think that the confusing part about that is people will say, well, but we're all imperfect and we're going to make some mistakes. There's a difference between doing a sin because it was unintentional, you know, yeah. just because you're human, and living in sin, mm -hmm. practicing sin. Oh, let's we all do it. Let's all get groomed. You know, the, those are not accidents. No. Nope. <laughs> you have to go buy that bottle somewhere, and you have to come home and think about it. Yeah. Like that third bullet point you have is similar in our time to one sake I would say. What comes to my mind is, is what if you're in that sin, in the middle of that sin, and you die? Mm -hmm. Hello, you're living a world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people do that all the time. That's what Paul always says, you have to sacrifice yourself. Yeah. You don't need to. Yeah, and those groups read all the same scriptures that we've been quoting here, but they have a way of understanding them differently, and they they, well, they, they can be blind to the truth. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so I dug a little bit more into that uh, eternal security idea uh, here, and and so I got a quote from uh, a website called Got Questions. And they are a site that kind of focuses on answering questions that people have about the Bible. And the question that they're dealing with here is called, is eternal security a license to sin? Okay, as, as we've been talking about here. And so this is the once saved, always saved idea. And they're asking, is that a license to sin? And, and what they, the quote that they have here is, a person who has truly been redeemed by Jesus Christ will not live a life characterized by continuous willful sin. Okay. That's their, their definition for it, and I'm sure that they pulled that from some source. Um, so, But notice how that definition leaves you wiggle room in your life. Uh, and So you can say, well, it, I don't continuously willfully sin, I just occasionally willfully sin. Would that be okay? Well, no. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and so the, the whole problem with the uh, once saved, always saved, eternal security idea is that it opens that door where you can say, well, it's okay once in a while, or it's okay if I don't do it too much. Uh, and so you kind of find a way to get into that license to sin situation. And, and so um, uh, it, it also leads to not knowing if you have sinned too many times. So eternal security can put you in a situation where you know that you've sinned, and, and maybe sinned a few times, but you don't know if you've sinned too many times because it, 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 they characterize it as being a continuous willful sin. So you don't know your, your situation, your state with God. And so um, Paul says, um, and both Paul and John speak on this topic, um, Paul says a willful sin tramples on, gate, on grace and there is no atonement. And then John says there is a sin that is mortal sin. And, and so they are, are saying the same thing is if you have that heart for a willful sin, then you're out. That's it. You're done. Okay. And one quick addendum here. Um, I, and then we're done. <laughs> I know of no one in our time who believes in classical Gnosticism. I said that earlier in this, um, but there are so many similar ideas in our time. Um, and, and John one 
although it was written for Gnostics of, of that time, um, it still ap applies because the same kinds of ideas are, are around here. And that's that combination of um, knowledge and reformulating Jesus into something that isn't biblical. And, and so we, we saw that that's what the Gnostics were up to. They believed they had a secret knowledge uh, about Jesus and all sorts of other things. And that secret knowledge brought them salvation rather than Jesus bringing them salvation. And so there are some people in, in the world who are Christian curious. They're, they kind of want to be Christians in a way, but they're uncomfortable with God or Jesus as he's depicted in the Bible. And so those, those people go out looking for different things. And, and so if, if you're looking for a different kind of God or a different kind of Jesus, you start making up things. And, and so in, that, in our time, we have people who have uh, turned to education because they have no discernment and, and they start picking up uh, all sorts of um, educated ideas, but these are not biblical ideas. These are ideas from people who are really against God. And, and, and so if you get too much of this kind of education, you have no discernment to, to filter out those things that are nonsense and garbage. And you can become overeducated and confused about things. And you, can, and you can lose your focus on the biblical Jesus and start chasing after what all these educators or, or people who are writing books can tell you about Jesus. And, and that's definitely a problem in our culture is that there are a lot of well-known preachers who have written books, lots of books, and, and those books aren't always good and not always correct. And, and you have to be discerning in everything that you read and throwing away the things that are wrong. And, and so some of these people have decided that the Gospels were written to present Jesus in a particular way, or they contain many made up stories about miracles. Those miracles weren't really real. They were something else. And I, I've read some of those books uh, myself, and you can see what they're, how they're trying to trick you into um, reinterpreting what the Bible says um, and into their way of thinking. Um, and, and you need to be able to recognize that and say, no, that's not at all what the Bible is saying. Um, and they have all sorts of different ways of doing that. There's uh, many, many ways to twist the Bible around. And, and so these people kind of get puffed up by the knowledge that they have, and they think that they're smarter than everybody else, and their, their ego uh, kind of gets control of them. And, and once you've got an ego problem, you start to think that you can rely on yourself and that you're smart enough yourself to, to do things. And, and with that, faith disappears when you start relying on yourself and thinking that you are self-reliant. Um, and so these people wind up walking away from faith because they're actually chasing after something else um, that is not biblical at all. And, and I've seen that many times. I've also seen something, I've had a couple pastors talk uh, about this. Um, some of them, when they went to the Bible schools or wherever they got their, their degrees from, their ministry degrees, uh, some of them came out either as unbelievers or they came out as not being sure what they believed about Jesus and whether he was real. And so there are even theological seminaries that teach uh, stuff in such a way that you, you can come out of there. And I remember one guy wrote a, a page on that, and, and he specifically said he went in, into this theological seminary. And once he graduated, he had decided that Jesus never existed. And, and, and so that seems like a bizarre thing. But, but some of those uh, universities are teaching strange ideas and, and not at all what uh, matches up with the Bible. So in all things, discernment is required. I don't think that um, it's something that the school necessarily does. I think they draw a lot of you from what's already there. Uh, for example, I, I know some person that completely lost his faith, and he went to the back of university, and his parents said to him, that terrible university, if you hadn't gone there, this would have never happened. He said, I graduated from there, I'm a pastor, and I, that's not affecting me at all. I said, the problem is it's already in him, and, mm -hmm. and it draws out the wrong things in him, you know, and, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's point, it's appropriate to point fingers and blame other things. It's, in the end, we're the ones that will be judged. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, of course that's true. Mm -hmm.